Good morning. This is David Benson, CEO and founder of Cornhusker Hybrids LLC, located in Lincoln, Nebraska, where we, our trademark is success starts with the seed. Now, when I started this YouTube channel, I promised to do some things a little bit different than what the noise you, most of you people involved in plant breeding here on a normal basis. I mean, some of you get all of the, you know, at the uh, academic end of things. Others of you get all of the field applications. We're going to try to bring those together and make you a better, better breeder of whatever crop it is you work with. But today, I found out a number of things when I got out of college very early that didn't agree with things that I had been taught and believed about quantitative genetics. So when I look at my corn breeding program over time, and I've had time to do that, I call those quantitative genetic myths. And we're going to talk about those, and eventually I'm going to put some kind of a lecture series about, together about those with actual data and pictures and everything else. But today we're going to talk over the top about it. And the number one I'm going to start with is population size. Now when you take quantitative genetics, they don't ever tell you what the population size should be actually, but you know from people that do it, and you know that it needs to be big, right? You gotta have a big population size is what they teach you because there's so much variation out there and you wanna capture as much as that as you can in your breeding program. But remember, the only variation you need to capture in your breeding program is the positive variation for the traits you need. The rest of the variation you wanna get rid of as quickly as possible. So, you're a breeder out there, what do you do? I mean, that's one of the first things you gotta decide besides the F2s you're gonna work, and by the way, we'll get to that. I have never met an F2 that I didn't like. In other words, I like them all. So how have I rationalized that over time? But population size, I know sometime back, a year or two, five years ago, I come across some literature from Monsanto when they were actually Monsanto before Bayer bought them, and it was to the extent that, you, that a breeder needed to look at, or a company, needed to look at 10,000 lines from a population in order to find one that was 8% better than the mean of either of the parents for what they look. Now remember, when you're breeding corn and you're breeding in the United States, you're looking for a red-eyed dwarf. I call them red-eyed dwarf. You've got to find something that stands out from everything else. You can't just be as good as the last population you put out or 20 years or 100 years ago like some countries. Here you have to really produce, and if you don't get them, you don't win, and if you don't win, pretty soon you're out of job and your company's bought up by other people. But so, you know, okay, so let's say, yeah, maybe quantitative genetic theory, in order to find one, it depends on the population, 8% better, which is a lot, that's a jump. Um, it, it may take a large number, but how do you get that large number? I mean, it depends on how you think of a population. If you think of a population when you're breeding corn, like I do, and this won't come into play with all other crops. This is mostly a cross-pollinated talk, but it's still the same thing when you're working with self-pollinated crops, clonally propagated crops, that, you know, whatever, however the method of sexual reproduction is, you still got a question about how many individuals to look at. I mean, it's the number one question. You can't, it's all about sampling. You can't sample everything and you can't sample nothing. You have to pick something in between. And what is it? And what's your, you know, why do you do it? And so in my own personal situation, I am a firm believer in small populations, looking at a lot of them. And I just look at it a different way. I look at it that I'm breeding corn, I need a stiff stock population on one side, a non-stiff stock population. I breed within those, I cross across, over time I get improved cultivar from, and every year you're doing this. Once you have a breeding program going, every year you're making selections, every year you're making F1s, every year you're selfing F2s. Now, if, if you're in the DH business, it simplifies things over what I've done most of my career because you go inbred quickly. But you still have to test, you still have to decide how much variation, you still have to decide how many populations to use, and you still have to decide how many out of every population. Here, regardless of whether you're breeding DH. Now, 
you're going to back those up into whatever you're told or whatever your resources are so it makes your program work, right? So that you can get the number of improved lines at the end. You start with a bigger funnel at the top and you breed it down and that breeding pipeline tickles out these better individuals at the end and it does, it's proven for 100 years that it works in breeding corn. Starting with 10 lines that were about all we started with really. And we're still working the genetics of the same 10 lines in different in different forms over and over. But, so how many, what is your population size? Are you going to have one population in 2,000 lines or 2,000 populations in one line or one population, 1,000 populations in two lines? And I would say, in my personal opinion, your way, if you were have, that was the only choice you had, you would take the large number of populations in a few lines. And again, just think of that as a population. This one's a population, okay? This is a population over here, you got 2,000 lines. This is a population over here, you got 2,000 lines. This one, you used 1,000 F2s, but this one, you only used one F2, but still, you have the same number, let's just say you did. So, I'm gonna tell you about when I first started breeding corn, my very first year out of the gate, I totally blew the idea of needing big population sizes out of the water. First year. Just, I've never went back to it. I don't believe in it. And I've got evidence that says it works, like 50 patents. So it does work. So I was lucky enough. I worked at, at McCurdy Seed Companies. There was a fellow there. They started the program, McCurdy Family, in the 1920s or 30s. And Leroy just became the breeder, and James was the guy that did the production, and they ran the company, and they got really good until Agrogenetics bought them and destroyed them. But that's a whole other another story, because that's what happens when a lot of people buy companies, and more or less, that you never hear from them again. So, but Leroy, he would just, he bred everything he could get his hands on together, and he would take four lines out of every F1, he actually he took 12 lines out of every F1. Four of them himself to like the S13, and the other, other eight, he backpassed four to one parent, four to the other, and he got 12 lines at the end. And I want to tell you, Leroy McCurdy was pretty damn successful. It developed some pretty darn good lines, and a lot of them were different than a lot of other people would have got. He also tested in the South and did a lot of things. He was into full season stuff. But I learned right out of the shoot, here's a guy, he's only taken four inbreds, but he's taken every population out there.